does it ever feel like you have to divorce your characters and move on onto another one? I think it's a forever relationship. They don't die. It's for- <laughs> That's what I was about it's to say. It's a forever it's relationship. Forever they relationship. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, some people are going to come for you. I said, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 is, it, it lasts longer than, than many other relationships, I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> What has your writing journey been like so far? Yeah. And it's like such a wide blanket question, but I like, let's, right. let's see where this goes. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but I like it. I like it because there's there are so many things to talk about. So, um, and I like that you call it storytelling, not just writing, mm. because it, there are a lot of things involved. And I, I always like to think of myself first as a storyteller than a writer, because I, I literally started that way, like verbally. So as a child then, and I know that there are, there are a number of writers that started this way too, that we would just be in our classrooms, in primary school, secondary school, and you are just making up stories for your small circle of friends and everybody just waiting for break time or free period, and then we just have fun and you're just telling stories. So that was literally me. I just like to tell stories. I, would, I could sit down here and I'm making up something in my head and it's sounding like the most realistic thing or oh, i'm telling you a film from the beginning to the end all over again and it's like you're watching it and you don't even mm-hmm. need to go and see it you literally just get to watch it from my voice so that's pretty much it um i started writing really young because i grew up with a dad mm-hmm. that had a library and he loves to read and so it was a thing that my dad would bring books he would buy me books and I would read and then we would sit down and we would talk about them. And so from the little girl that was reading Lantern, graduated to African writer series and, you know, just kept on going that way. So it was, it was very important for my dad reading because, again, reading is what exposes your mind. And to be a great storyteller, you also, you know, you, your mind has to be in a lot of places. You need to experience different things. And what better way to experience things than in books or in film? And that's pretty much why I also like film, because um, growing up to my house, we, we used to watch everything. Is it Bollywood? Is it Hollywood? Is it Nollywood? We were that family that we would go and rent videos, <laughs> video cassettes from like the nearby rental and we we'll watch or we we'll borrow cassettes from our neighbor and then we we'll buy our own so we pretty much that. So storytelling is is a thing that has been <laughs> been instilled in me since a child, since I was a child. And then when I knew that it want it was going to be mm. more serious than just you know, telling stories in class or writing stories in my notebook that I would pass to my friends to read. Was um, around primary six. I was eight, seven at the time. And um, there was this book by Ife Sinachi Okoli. I think she's Ife mm. Sinachi Okoli now. Um, she works with hair holdings now, I think, also. And um, she had this book, Deep Regret. She had written it, she was 14 when she wrote the book. So when I was reading the book then in primary school, I think one of my classmates brought it and stuff and we were passing it and we read. And I was just like, somebody could write a, a novel at 14. And I'm like, I want to do this thing. I want to be able to tell stories like this too. And that was when I knew that, yeah, this was what I wanted to do. And I know that I, I actually wrote something. I wrote something at the time. And I just, you know, typed it on the our mod- our monitor at home. My yeah. dad was excited. Well, my dad is a big router. My brother was a big router. <laughs> God rest his soul. So he, he would, you know, he would just. I just wrote everything, typed everything, and then printed it. And he would just show it to anybody that comes to the house. That ah, this is what his daughter wrote. So that made me feel like, yeah. There's something there. If my dad is this proud of, you know, the stuff I put on paper, then there's actually something there. And it just kept on going like that. Honestly, I had my first book um, in 2014. It was a book on child autism. The title is Letters from an Imbecile. Uh, I just really wanted to focus on how, especially where I come from. I come from Delta State, mm. and Ugeli precisely. It's a place where 
people don't know so much about these things. They would just write you off as so if a child has special needs, mm. it's basically like a in for lack of better word, or as they would call it over there, they say, Oh, you are a dummy, you are a dundee, or oh, lodo, this one doesn't know anything. And they don't know that there is more to it. Like this child actually needs a little more help than the average child. And so it was something I wanted to touch on because my mom is a teacher, or she was, she's a retired teacher. So she, at the time, she was a teacher. And I had visited her in school several times when I was in secondary school. And there were students like that in her class. And pretty much you would see their parents are like, eh, this one, they should just help them to pass. And nothing mm -hmm. happens because it's government schools. Which teacher, who, which teacher has the time to want to take care of, you know, to give right. a child extra time? So it was something I wanted to talk about, yeah, and just create that awareness around it that this thing is not, it's not like it, your child is not an imbecile. Your child is not a donty like you think. There is so much. And these children are one of the most brilliant set of children you can find. You just haven't tapped into their mm. potential. You just don't know how to support them and bring this out. So that was what led to my first book. It wasn't as successful as it would be, as I would have wanted it to be, but it was a book that put me out there. Mm. And I'm forever grateful for it and happy that I wrote it when I did. Because it was also what pushed me to say, check, trying for more things, writing short stories, submitting to big magazines, entering for competitions and all that stuff. So I think that's pretty much my whole writing journey. And when it got to writing letters from an industry, from there it just took off. Like, this is what I wanted to do. And I also knew that I wanted to, for the longest time, I didn't think I wanted to write for film. Mm. Um, it was really just prose for me, writing novels, writing books. But I really liked film. So in 2016, I was in uni then. I started taking courses, screenwriting courses. I was doing like, you know, self-training myself and all that stuff and just writing specs, trying to practice here and there. And I just knew that, okay, yeah, at some point, film was also something I wanted to do. And that, was, that has also led me to, to that aspect of writing. As Amazing. Well. So, yeah. So just telling beautiful stories, that's what I stand for. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I love that, Jordan. I, love, I also <laughs> love your relationship with your dad. Like, that is so cool. Like, um, um, and... Yeah. And when you were talking, I mean, you were talking about how he supported you and that entire journey. I kept thinking also about <clears throat> what it is like to have a um, a family that encourages the literacy culture, um, and yeah. and what it does to you. In fact, I think earlier today I was someone was talking about how important it is for a child to have someone read to them bedtime stories type of thing you know those things that sometimes you see you know in movies yeah. that we see uh someone was not grow up with our parents <laughs> reading to us <laughs> you know, but, but it's it, it is a beautiful culture right that literacy culture yeah <laughs> and I, I keep i'm thinking to myself um what is it about the words that you know that we create what is it that that it has the ability to spark a child's imagination and and why is it so powerful that we have that those elements all around us uh because you never know where that spark will come from but you know it comes from somewhere whether you're reading mm -hmm. it to your child or whether your child finds it somewhere in your in your library that you in your case with your dad but could the, the literacy culture i guess that i'm getting at is could there be something in there that we're not tapped into as a people as a culture is there something about literature being in the home that yeah. is an untapped potential i think that um one problem i would say is the fact that i think that there is a lazy culture around reading as much as there is also a heavy culture around reading there's also this lazy culture around it people find it People just want to watch something, right? And, you know, people find it easier to visualize something than to actually do the mental visualization. Let them see it with their eyes and for them to see it in their mind. And I also think it's a problem from, if you don't start it with your child, then they really don't get to, it's going to be hard to start as an adult reading. Personally, for me, as a child, I used to read more than I read now because, I mean, life has happened. You have nine to five, you have different <laughs> things to do on your table, and you are just, you know, trying to make money in this hard economy. So it's something that you have to start yeah. from 
like you said, as we see in the Oyibo movies, read bedtime stories to your children, cultivate the habit of reading. And as adults yourself, know the importance of reading. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, and he talked about how he doesn't have respect for, you know, people who, if you say you want to go into the creative space and you don't read, you know, you don't mm. try to learn. And that's the truth, because how do you actually learn something if you're just sitting in your own small world and you're not trying to, it's not just about, reading is more than just enjoying, it's learning. You, you learn about the medieval world, you learn about history, you learn about how love stories are told in Iran, how it's told in India, how it's told in the US. Just You just get different perspectives of different things just from reading. And as much as you can get that from films too, there's, it's a different kind of vibe yeah. when it comes to books. And yeah, exactly. It's a different kind of vibe. And you learn, apart from, you learn a lot of things. It helps your grammar, it helps your diction, it helps how you just, you know, compose yourself and all of that stuff. So what I would say is on that, I think it's just pretty much the same thing. That lazy reading culture that, oh, uh, yeah, they are teaching them, they teach the children in school what they read in school is enough. When they come home, also spend time with your kids, also try to, you know, know what they are reading, let them, so like I said, what my dad would do is when he buys me those books, after I read them, he would expect me to come and, you know, give him a summary of what I read. So it wasn't just a, you read and you drop and you forget about what you read. It was the, you are actually internalizing what you've read and you're getting lessons from it. So I think that that's, a, that's something that can be done and it's probably not um, I don't know, but I don't. I don't know that it's done as often in my people. I don't think that there is that culture as it should be. You know, you there is something beautiful about your relationship with your dad that, like, I so admire the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> it's so so cool. I don't want yeah, to. I, I always to this. like to talk about it. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> just 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 digging a little bit with you. Let's just talk about your dad for a sec. Yeah, I mean. Um, how much yeah. of your stories now uh, are influenced by your relationship with him? I mean, I know you, you also have things in the works behind what you've written yeah. in the past, but how much of your storytelling uh, do you think are influenced by yeah. your relationship with him? And, I, and I'm going to go a bit into my, I personally, I am passionate about storytelling and I crafted a few stories yeah. over the years. And one thing I've seen is, one or two of them have a pattern with, with, with the concept or with the, or with the topic of coming of age, of you know coming from a place of being a boy into yeah. a man, and, and I and I've always admired mm -hmm. that concept, uh, that trajectory of thought, and it's something that I look forward to one day passing on to my own children, and um, and that comes from my personal background, my experiences not necessarily having grown up with my own dad in the, in, the, in that sense and, and me kind of yeah. yearning to want to be a custodian of manhood for the children that I will sire someday. Um, but in your case, you have such a beautiful story and, and I'm wondering how much um, of that, you know, influences your work, how much of your backstory, the hidden backstory that we don't see, how much yeah. of that influences the work <laughs> that you do or the work that you hope to do? <laughs> so now that I think about it, I don't even think that my work reflects me so much. It's it's very different from my experiences and from me. So in my book, Letters from My Name Sale, I did tap into a lot of because I was writing from home. I was writing in, you know, my locality. The the setting of the book was there. So there were some experiences that I did tap in. The the main characters dad is not the coolest dad so it was a complete opposite of my dad um but i think when i was writing that i could see that yeah this is not how a dad should be to their child you know because i had a father that was completely different from that i had a dad that i could literally express anything to and i felt safe with and in the case of my character um, her dad wasn't that. It was more like, okay, I'm wasting money on this child. Like, what am I going to do with you? You're literally not passing anything in school. And your younger sister is ahead of you in class and all of that stuff. But when it comes to other writings, I am very... <laughs> my me or this me and the characters i create the stories i tell they are very very different i like to i like drama i like um thrillers i like touching stories 
So there's a there's a particular if you read my work, a friend of mine was telling me that there's something about this, that when she reads my work, she can tell that I wrote this right. But I also like to explore. I like to write different kind of characters. I like to write men. I like to write women. I don't know if I'm so good at writing men, but I try. I think that I, I try my best. And um, <laughs> so um, I, I wouldn't say that. The only thing I had written that really reflected my dad was a story about him or an essay rather about him. So he passed in 2013, and um, I wrote I, I wrote that piece um, in 2019. I believe 2019 or 2020, I can't quite piece it right now. And um, it's called Forgetting Daddy. And it was just an essay that I just, for after, so 2013 to 20, um, 2020, that was about seven years after, I finally write about how I felt about his death and you know just how it's been the last how many years. So that's pretty much the only thing that I've actually written that talks about my relationship with my father. Rather than that, my stories are just what they are, stories, uh, fictional, and there's really little I tap in from my personal life. Maybe I can tap in from my community, things that I've experienced as a child and seen and all that stuff. But yeah, there's really, unless it's an essay, it, it's really not going to reflect me. Mm, interesting. Now you were talking about characters, and I really <laughs> want to go in there for a little bit because characters yeah. really... Yeah, they, they really are the heartbeat of you know a story uh, when you see the decisions yeah. that they take and they make. But there is something about the building of them that is very different for each person or each writer. And I'm I'm curious about your yeah. process in how you you know, you 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 draw a character's essence and how you craft a character's yeah. storyline through line all the way to the very end. Um, if you were to if you were to look at your strategy for storytelling, what would you say is the very best way for you to bring a character to life, to make a character uh, uh, stand out? Yeah. So first of all, most of the time, my characters, they write me. I don't write them. Let me start with that. <laughs> they literally write me. They literally take me on the journey. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I think the first thing I do is I want to know what the first thing I do is I like mm. to know what kind of story I'm telling. So mm. that helps me know what kind of characters I want to create. So let's take for example, um, um, let me think. I have this story on Africondo. It's called Mami Water, and it's um, about colorism. It's set in the 80s, uh, and it just follows a very narrative form of telling. So in that story, I wanted to talk about a, a man that his mother basically controls in the sense that she was the one who's going to choose who he will marry. So he had this woman that he loved, and you know all that stuff and they were pretty they were good for each other and all but she was yoruba is evil and you know we have that um and that that trope in stories like that and then the mother comes and she's like hey she's too dark have you not seen how our evil girls look like mommy waters they are yellow and all that kind of stuff and then he leaves her and goes so when i was writing that guy's character and basically picture what i did was what would this guy be like because most of the times men like this or people like this, let me not say men like this, people that are easily influenced by maybe their parents' decisions or friends, there's a particular thing, they, they, they have this aura around them when they are away from their parents, like I can make my own decisions, I do what I want, and then when the parent comes, it's like you're seeing a different person. So that was the first thing I wanted to have in that character. His name is Osita. So the person I wanted for Osita was, to be a man when we first see him that owns, you know, owns his own world, owns his relationship, loves his woman. And then when his mom comes later, we're seeing him as a different person. So Osita's journey for me was because, and, and I didn't need, it's a short story, so I don't really need to look as far back as, oh, when he was born, what he was like, and all those kind of stuff. I just need to know the now and where next he's going to. So for that character, it was really just, who is he now? What is he going to be like in the next couple of paragraphs? So in developing my characters, I just like to know where their journey is leading them. And like I said, they end up leading me. So when I'm writing, when I start off, 
I know well what I want this character to be, but as I write, I basically just follow them because characters, as much as you are creating them, they become people. So you just you just get to see how they are. Like when you get, so let's say I get to know you better now. Um, we get talking over a couple of weeks. I'll start knowing the things you like. I'll start knowing the things you you don't like, you know, how you speak, what time you go to bed, what movies you like, that kind of stuff. It's the same thing when you're writing characters. So as you write them, as you follow their journey, you begin to know oh, what this person would ordinarily like, what this person would sound like, what this person. So I'm not saying, I know that there are some writers that, and I wish I was like that, that would first of all really build this world for their characters from birth to probably when they die, the things that we don't see and the things that we see. But I do all of that mental work in my head. Unless it's for film and I need to create a character Bible, create a character description, yes, then I do all of that. But if I'm writing prose, especially if it's in the short form, I just do all of that mental work in my head. Like, who is this person? What would be like? What is it going to be like in the next couple of paragraphs? And I just let him flow or half flow like that and we get there. So you know what you just described right now? I kept thinking to myself, like, this sounds like a, a relationship. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you're, you're getting to know this guy, you're getting to know this girl, uh, you know, go on yeah. your first date, you know, you start to you, you chat, you talk, I, I, yeah. and you keep developing more and more and more. But here's the thing, right? You go on this journey and you know this person and you, and you, you, you fall in love with this person or, or you love, hate this person. But then at the point, you have to stop yeah. the book. You have to put the book to print and, and whatnot. Um, does it ever feel like you have to divorce your characters and move on onto another one? I, I, I always feel like um, my characters are very... So yes, maybe I would... Um, let me see. Do I ever miss my characters? Because they are always there. <laughs> they are literally <laughs> always there. I would just pick up the story and I'm back to their world. So I don't think that I miss them. Do I miss writing them? Maybe. Yes. Mm. Because there is just this sweet feeling about when you're telling this person's story and then it comes to an end and you're just like, okay, that's enough. But I like to think of it like being God. So when God created man, he did all the molding and he's like, yeah, go on on your journey. But it's not like man is out of God's sight. He's literally still there. He can still see, but God is not controlling anything you do anymore. You're just, you know, there. It's the same mm. thing with stories for me after I've finished and dropped the pen. It's just like, yeah, I've done the work and then let other people experience this character just like I experienced them when I was creating them. And if I want to experience them again, I pick up the story and I would actually like to read my own work in notes. I'm not one of those people that don't like to read their stuff. I really like to read my stuff. Really? <laughs> so I, I actually enjoy <laughs> reading my stuff. Yeah. I I literally I I literally read my stuff over and over again. There was a story I was even reading just although it's not published yet, there was something I wrote and I was just reading it before I came on this call. So I actually enjoy reading my stuff. So if you look I think at your work, it's a forever relationship. You don't die. It's a forever. <laughs> That's what I was about to it's say. It's a forever relationship. It's a forever you relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, some people are gonna come for you. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 is, it, it lasts longer than than many other relationships. I mean. Oh, okay. It, it <laughs> But if you look at your work um, and you look at the characters you've created, what are some of the things that you would say has been your, as it were, has been, you know, almost like the, the, the pitfalls to getting deep into the process? Um, and this is oh. going to be, a, this is another blanket question, but, um, you know, I, I, I still see writing as a very, you know, immersive process. And I like the fact that I use the story of creation, yeah. um, you know, the process of creation, you know, you're just focused on creating that. Nothing else exists, you know, until that thing exists. Yeah. But in, during that time, you are, you, are, you are in that process, you are in there. And I've heard several people complain about the, the, the amount of focus and the amount of dedication that is required to stay in that place. Yeah. Um, for everybody, it is different. Um, um, 
but there are certain concerns and pitfalls and number one and the biggest one of them is the writer's block uh, uh yeah. I, I know so i know someone who who has been writing something for three years, four years, five years, right? I you know I have been writing one or two things for quite some time. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah. you know, how do you manage that, you know, that that moment when you first and foremost can't get the answer straightforward or you are going through this very long process of building your character, telling your story. Um, what are yeah. some of the pitfalls for you? Curious. Hmm. Ah, uh, like you said, writer's block, that is something. But I, I think that one thing I do is if, I, if I'm writing, because I have a work, speaking about writing works for years and all that stuff, I have something I started in 2019, you know, 2020, there about, and it's still sitting in my laptop. I'm not halfway through. It's a novel, and it's there. And every time I just keep, you know, developing and developing. So one thing I do is if it's getting to a point, because writing is hard, as much as it's an enjoyable task, it's a job. And you're, you're basically bringing something to life. So it can get difficult. And you can feel like, okay, I don't even know what I'm doing. You can get to a point in your story and you're just like, okay, none of this makes sense. I want to tear it all down and start again. And it's happened, there are stories I've abandoned um, that I've started and then I get somewhere, I'm just like, okay, this is not working and I just drop it. Sometimes I abandon it for good, sometimes I abandon it and maybe after a month, after two, I pick it back up. So what I like to do is give it space. It's, I mean, mm. if, you, if you need space, you need space. Like you said, it's a relationship. So if it's getting toxic, <laughs> Let's call it that. If you're having a toxic relationship with what you're writing, how did we get here? Like, <laughs> you no longer you, you you can't even feel what you're writing anymore, mm. and you know you need you need time apart from it. And when you come back, you have a fresh you have fresher eyes, you have a fresher mm. mindset towards the story you're trying to tell. Mm. So for me, really, what I experience is I get writer's block. It's not, it's not, so, sometimes I get confused. Maybe I want to rewrite a story um, in a way. I, I've even gotten the notes on how to rewrite it. I've made the notes or I got someone else to make the notes and yeah, these notes are, are it. I need to do it that way. But what's the starting point? How do I go about something that I've, I've written 5,000 words or 10,000 words. Where do I start from with tearing this down and creating it all over again? So there's that issue. I, I experience that sometimes. I don't know where to start from in writing a work or in developing a work. So what I just do sometimes is I give it, a, I give it time. I just leave it. I just let it sleep. There's something I've let sleep now in my computer. I'm just like, I'll come back to it in another three, four days. and. I, I probably would have fresher eyes and a fresher perspective on how to deal with it. So that's pretty much what I what I do. And so if I experience that, because I get that a lot, um, if, especially if it's long, is longer length um, or longer form prose, longer form fiction, I would just be like, okay, just let it be, let it cool off, and then come back to it. But I also say don't leave it for too long. Because sometimes you might come back and you don't recognize your story or you don't recognize these characters and you're just even confused where to, you know, start from. Another thing I like to do is I like somebody else to look at my work. Because we writers, we can be very passionate. You know what I mean? You're a storyteller yourself. We can be very passionate about the things that we write and the things that we create. And we're just like, yes, this is it. It's perfect. And then you give it to somebody else to read and they come back with notes like, ah, this thing that you said is the best thing to slice bread. Sorry, oh, this, 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 this. <laughs> and, and truthfully, I, I actually like, but it should be somebody you trust. It should be somebody you know knows their onions because everybody, not everybody can give you a like good reviews or concrete feedback that is useful to you. You should also know how to filter field and feedback. So for me, I like to give my work to somebody I trust, um, a good writer, a good editor. Take a look at it for me. What do you think? And I have a couple of these people. So it's, and I think that with writers, we always have our community. Uh, one thing that stood out for me was in Unidel, there was a community that I was part of. It's called Creative Writers Niche. 
So and it still so I just basically gained a lot of connections from there and also in um my in the last couple of months also met some other writers through work, through trainings and all that stuff. So you just keep using your connection and you have this people, you reach out to them, give them your work, let them read, let them come back to you and see and then you take what works and it always helps. You, things that you did not notice, things that you did not know were missing or that were there that shouldn't be there because you just feel like everything works. But not everything works for your story. So when somebody takes um, an independent look at it, you cannot see that, oh, okay, truthfully, oh, this thing that I thought was the best thing, it really didn't work. Yeah. And then you can redevelop your work. So for me, just give it to somebody else. Take a break from your work if you feel like you're getting suffocated by it. Uh, if you have writer's block, do something else. Just distract yourself. And then, but don't wait it out too long. Don't think that writer's block will just disappear. And then it becomes procrastination. So you need to pick that book back up and, you know, just start working on it. Even if it's you write 100 words a day, 200 words a day, just keep it going. That's amazing. I, I, I love what you said about, you know, picking it up so that it doesn't become procrastination. That line, knowing that fine line, yes. that, that, that's powerful there. But talking yeah. about talking about uh, things that we're looking forward to, I, I'm actually looking forward to you actually writing about your dad as a hero in one of your books. <laughs> I'm just I'm just putting it out there, <laughs> just saying. I you, know, see. you have you have someone right here. You have a fan right here. They're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you.